I've been asked to talk about big data, broad data, and new data. And I was reminded this morning that people don't really want a washing machine, they just want clean clothes. So I'll try and bring that uh, to life today. At the core, as business leaders, what we want is performance for our company. And we've talked a lot about the fact that machines can replace human labor. What I want to talk to you about is actually that man and machine together can grow revenues. And that that's actually what the leading companies are doing. If you're only going after cost, that's last year's story. If you want to be leading in the future, you actually need to be going after growth. McKinsey and Company runs a survey every two to three years for the last 30 years, statistically determining what is it that's leading to performance for companies. Not just small companies, but really large companies as well, and the full spectrum. There have historically been three things that have mattered, and I'll give you the updated version of that, and then I'll talk to you about what's new. It first came out, statistically, in 2012. So, all of you folks that are back to the future, it's actually 2012, not 2015, when you actually ended up in the future. What was that? Three things that have historically been there. Engaging in next-generation collaboration with your trade partners up and down the value chain, whether you're in B2B, working with your distributors who understand the local market a bit better than you do, or whether or not uh, you're in uh, consumer goods and retail and you're working back and forth up and down that chain. Uh, they're building industry-shaping capabilities. Been doing that for a while. The latest version is that you know, heads of sales, for example, spend more than twice of uh, their time with developing their people. Why? Because as we discussed earlier today, the revolution we're undergoing is first and foremost a human revolution and a talent revolution. They're also spending three times as uh, much of their personal time leading to new sales enablement. We'll talk about that a little more. Placing forward-looking bets on new channels and uh, new ways of working with customers. But the thing that's new, those three have been around for a while, the thing that's totally new is those companies that are leveraging big data and advanced analytics are winning, statistically. So for those of you that were wondering, hey, do I wait or whatnot, no. Actually, you're late if you're waiting. First, we've had an explosion in data. There's big data, which you're familiar with. I want to introduce you, hopefully not totally introduce you, to broad data and then new data. Big data is the things you've been traditionally having inside of your four walls. You have full control over your internal ERP data. You have transactional data, and especially in a B2B environment. You have search data now. By the way, that's new, but it's totally contained. You have access to that yourself. And you have loyalty card data, or repeat history data, where you know who it is that's buying from you uh, over time. But there's been an explosion, and much less talked about, in the broad data. And this is where context comes in. Because now I have syndicated data about how my industry is performing. I've got government data about who's buying, where they live, how that's changing demographics, economics, especially when you get outside of the United States. I mean, we are witnessing the largest middle class explosion in the history of humanity. So keeping pace with that is hard because it's actually changing quite quickly. You also have so, anybody experienced the volatility in the markets of commodities? So you're in a B2B world, and that can really drastically change uh, how you're performing if you don't get it right. Weather. Remember when I was growing up, every, the example of what was unpredictable was weather. Not true today. Actually, we work with companies who use weather to change their promotions. Why? Because you can get a 50-50 prediction that's pretty good 10 to 12 days out, and that's enough time to change what you're putting on display and what you're selling to your customers. That's right, weather's predictable enough that we can operate on it in real live businesses today at scale. But there's a whole burst of new data. Everybody's abuzz with social, which is fantastic for personal engagement. Not so good for running your everyday uh, business from a pricing, promotions, assortment kind of uh, core. Uh, how, do, how does my sales force perform better? What's more interesting to me is all this online intelligence that's exploded. I can see what my competition is offering today and now and now and now. I see their pricing, I see their promotions, I see their assortment, I see their new innovations. If I'm listening, I can actually see what's coming before it gets released, and I can respond in advance of them actually releasing that. And that's been m much less talked about, but it's something that we leverage quite a bit. Um, and the other one I'll point out is real-time A-B testing. For those of you that don't spend your life in big data and advanced analytics in the detail, A-B testing lets you say, here's my normal situation, I'm going to test something over here and do a comparison. 
Imagine all of those studies that used to take a long time to design. We can now live design them and begin to execute them in five minutes with a full design of experiments. So that's a new world. Um, one of the things that's uh, coming about, though, is the ability to get more data than you have. We often work with our clients. They're focused on that big data of what you already own. They're working their way out. I'll just point out the online intelligence I mentioned. There's also crowdsourcing. For some of the folks in the audience were with retail, but also with banking. You can have mystery shoppers go in and actually tell you what's going on. And they can do that in B2B as well. Hey, Mr. Purchaser, what was the deal you just got? And if you report it back to me, I'll give you some... Oh, wow, I've got, I've got a verifiable competitive intel that did not come through my sales force. Holy smokes, what do I do with that as a business leader? And then, by the way, customers are more than happy to engage with you collaboratively. Remember, we're working collaboratively up and down the supply chain, uh, and we enable that process as well. So what's the paradigm shift? Because in a sense, if you've been on top of it, you know those things are happening. The paradigm shift is that all that sales and search data is the world's largest conjoint you've ever had. You can completely change the way you sense what your customers want and predict it. So you've moved away from uh, primary research as your intercept where when you're talking to somebody, it's like in a focus group around this table right here, suddenly everybody's looking at you. You don't behave the same as you do in the, in the ocean, and so you, we use fish as our analogy. And you start seeing what real customers do when they're unprompted. You have hundreds of thousands of observations versus few hundred. This allows you to throw away the dirty data. Every data stream is dirty, so you want to actually clean it down to what you can really use. And you're going to still have more statistics than anybody else can do uh, in the past. And that unlocks whole new mathematical techniques. The interaction cost is pennies on the dollar, and you're able to update and automate that. And that leads to totally new ways of working. What underpins this paradigm shift? Customers. Customers are what and why and how they buy. They're no longer just individuals or corporations. Actually, I'm defining them off of their behavior because I'm defining them off the data streams that I can automate. What and why they buy is not products. They buy attributes. They buy attributes of their search or attributes of their transaction. They work with me based on what I'm giving them that they actually, in an underlying way, really need. And by the way, if you're throwing away your search data, you're throwing away some of the most interesting data that you've got out there. Off of this, since I know who you are, what your past behavior is, why you buy, and who's similar to you, I can predict your future purchases before you know it. I can predict the new... The new um, uh, invention that you've come up with, how well is that going to sell? Well in advance. I can determine the promotional performance with three to five times le you know, more accuracy than used to be available one week ahead, 16 weeks in advance. I can change what gets manufactured. That's, these kind of lead times and predictive capability have really changed. At the core, though, it's about man and machine. That's what drives the revenue growth. Because man is good at some things and machines are good at some things. And it turns out they're not the same things. And together, they, they beat the performance of either one alone. A little footnote that I'll point out there. What are humans good at? I sometimes get asked. They're really good at feeling. They sense when the data is dirty. They sense when it's not matching reality. They sense the right way to sell in to customers. They can sense what customers are willing to buy and behave in the future differently than they have in the past. Computers are very good at looking at the past and forecasting. And the combination of the two works really, really well. Um, leaders are putting this in the intelligence, uh, in the hands in the front line. I'm going to give you three quick case examples. I want to take you from 300,000 feet to the front line real fast. I'm going to do that in three industries real quick to just show you that this is cutting across. I'll talk about consumer retail, talk about B2B, and then I'll talk uh, about banking. Ever wondered why what's on the shelf where you shop is what's there? The traditional approach has been sort of a generic allocation of space, or maybe because a manufacturer paid me to put it on the shelf, that's what I put there. Often, people that started to get a little analytical about it would rank the SKUs by their sales rank, wouldn't think about substitution, wouldn't think about loyalty effects, like, hey, if I don't have that product, is this valuable customer of mine actually walking across the street to my competitor? Am I forcing them to make multiple shopping trips? By the way, forcing them to go shop to my competitor? And what does the effect that have on me on repeat purchase? When shoppers shop the category, they have different degrees of loyalty to different SKUs. What they're really buying is the underlying attributes, by the way, but we'll stick to the SKU level for a minute. 
And sometimes they're quite indifferent. And they can be really big skews. Lemon and lime, I picked the soda category because most people will engage in that. Lemon and lime buyers mostly swap. It's a very similar taste palette. They're mostly happy. If one's not available, they'll buy the other. But if you look at ginger ale buyers, that's a specific profile. And when you don't offer that skew because you took, you cut the tail, that shopper walks out. We talk about that as the walk rate. What's the walk rate when you do that? And why does that matter? Because then what I can do, and I'll keep it at the revenue level, we can go all the way to profit and service costs and all that, but simply, I can rank order my SKUs by revenue. I understand the walk rate difference by individual SKU by location, by shopper mix, which means if you tell me a location I don't have any data on, but you tell me the shopper mix, I can actually predict there. Gives you a very different rank ordering SKUs in green and red here. In fact, in this instance, we advised correctly, I'll point out, for the client to cut their number two skew. Which merchant is going to cut their number two skew in a category? No chance. They'll feel like they're going to get shot. With data, they have confidence to do that. You've now built their confidence to it. You explain with the underlying science the what, why, and how, and then they're able to act. And in fact, uh, you know, you relist skew number seven, uh, which would be the ginger ale-like example. You can see 30% of its customers if you don't offer that individual SKU, will walk out the door. And it's not that they're not buying. What you've really done is told them to go buy it at your competition. Most of the others have a much lower, uh, particularly you can see SKU number two has a pretty low loyalty. It just means it's a, it's a SKU that's generic. It's good enough for a lot of people, and so a lot of people buy it. You take the generic off the shelf, you put in the specific, and you actually retain the volume, and you retain the loyalty. I can talk to you about the advanced statistical methods that sit underneath that. Some of you may be interested. But basically, as I was saying, we can determine what you're buying and when that's not available, how might you choose to buy, how often are you going to potentially switch. And we can actually determine your loyalty, not to the SKU, but to every individual attribute that sits underneath it when you have enough data flow. Was not possible because we didn't have the computing power or the data 10 years ago when I started this. And that means you're getting actual behavior not reported. It's statistically relevant. You get the optimal SKU listings and facings at your local store if the retailer can execute at the local store level, which not all of them can. And it gives you a predictive sales forecast. Net effect, local assortment, and uh, getting the right facings and listings in the right locations. We helped that retailer grow their business twice as fast as the market was growing and saved 40% of category time. Why do I point that out? Because actually, those category managers redeployed that time to be thoughtful about what they need to be doing. And actually, uh, we put it back into strategic guidance of their categories. OK, that was example number one in retail. By the way, if you didn't realize that your retailers were able to know that about you, they do. So in the world of the discussion of do we want privacy or not, I don't even need to know that it's you. I just need to know that it's the same person that's coming over time. And we can predict that. We can also do it off of uh, uh, visits for uh, similar sites or uh, whatnot. Second, B2B. Just a lot of people go, yeah, but that takes too long. Because they're used to an old ERP implementation world that changed everything. That's not true in the digitized world that we now live in. So I'm going to give you an example of what we were able to do in six weeks. That's right, six weeks, which is, by the way, about as long as it takes to merge and integrate and clean the data. In parallel, we operated on what I'll show you as an interface. And ultimately, this was about putting these insights in the hands of the front line. Last time we talked about it in the front line merchants, uh, all the way down to the store level, this will be about a sales rep. There's about 200 sales reps in the US. Um, and this was about deal and price negotiation. They needed to know what to offer. And they took a crawl, walk, run approach. And six months later, uh, not only the data quality and profitably up, profitability up substantially, but the Salesforce feedback is uh, quite, quite good. This is what it looked like after six weeks, by the way, not the fully enterprise class. Fully deployed, operational. Why? Because I don't want the washing machine. I want the insights, or I don't want the clean clothes. The first piece here. Very standardized on the left side. You know, it's a custom front end, by the way, capability. The platform's the same. You can customize it for every client. You have an economic summary. You can add products and services, because most of these deals are multi-product and multi-service. Um, and it can suggest the next product to buy. 
what are similar customers like this purchasing? It actually helps the sales rep fill it out, make sure they don't forget a bunch of the valuable add-on services in particular. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, this is where the insights get very interesting. Transparency to seeing where they sit in the deal. I've given you an example where it's a really great deal. You can see goods on the right and on this uh, Pareto here. You can see the uh, th overall 30% discount would require um, my manager to approve. I've got deal scoring by customer and channel. I've got workflow enabled so I don't have to call anybody. I can be mobile on the road. You can see it's on an iPad app and I can actually have all that work. All the data is central and I can analyze on top of it for performance management over time as well as uh, advising me on my list pricing. And the science that sits under that, which is what people actually care about, is the fact that we can mine all of those transactions in past history, win, loss rate, et cetera. The algorithm's dynamic. It actually will update. It finds the patterns as you go. And this is an example of, of how, uh, you know, one case simplified down of how it split it. And you can see I've got large customers or small customers. Is the customer got a lot of employees or not? Which industry is it in? Starts ending up. Same product, widely different pricing levels. Widely. Why? Because the value in use was dramatically different. And you can see even inside there's a wide range, but as soon as I get, get my macro pattern right, I can already start providing you some insight. And you can see in the red, yellow, green, I can actually, within each segment, tell you what's good and what's bad. And that's what's powering the guidance. And in fact, most of our clients start with a well, if this person off, I have to have this manager approve. We're now moving them to say, no, no, no. If it's red, you need manager, you, know, you need senior approval. Yellow is a manager approval. Green, just let the people go. And you'll notice that that's differentiated. So you're not taking senior management's time on deals that they don't need to be involved with. You can also flip that around and say, who are your good salespeople and your bad salespeople? Machines are really helpful to humans because they can mine all the data. The amount of data we now have is so large there's nobody that can keep track of it. But machines can. And this is just some simple examples of the kinds of hidden leakages we find. When you find industry clustering in a large organization, you start going, hmm, it's the same product. Why is it different across industry? Do I just have a culture that has emerged in my sales force in that industry? Or is there a, a competitive behavior that's different in that industry? And I'll look into that. You know, second, when price is positively correlated volume, the more I charge them, the more they buy for me. Really? Or do you have a bunch of people trying to hit sales quotas by discounting to get that small customer that won't disrupt the market? You can say, you know, hey, price is not linked to the importance of my clients. And number one, if the salesperson name is the first predictor of discounting levels, yeah, you can figure out what to do there. So you can actually work on uh, uh, having the machine identify things. So that was example number two in B2B. Now I want to take you to banking, just to show you that these same techniques are able to pick up and move across data sets, across industries, across the globe, data rich, data poor. Advanced insights are helping in banking in a few ways. The same kinds of clustering and benchmarking, of course the transparency to product and uh, customer profitability are super helpful, especially if you start bundling and a lot of uh, banks are working on getting their products and services at a relationship level. That's, that's sort of step one of getting your data together, but what, however far together your data is, you can then do a few things. What's your economic value added tree? For those of you that don't participate in banking, that's an assessment of the potential value creation of that customer's lifetime value with you uh, over time. And it helps you mine and look for opportunities relative to benchmarks of how to boost the value of an individual client. That's right, down to an individual client. That's really helpful for a relationship manager. You can also give them, by the way, what's the next product to buy, reference pricing like we just discussed. Um, very helpful in these big deals where you negotiate, whether you're in banking or not. They call it you know, booked and realized revenue. So you'll plan on, I'll give you a lower mortgage rate because I'm planning on you giving me some other services. Uh, that's probably a that's, uh, consumer example. In the corporate banking, I'll give you a lower lending rate because I'm expecting a lot of uh, foreign exchange uh, volume from you. Well, that's what was planned with the deal. The question is, did the customer live up to that over time? And I can now manage that over time because it's all in the same system. So I can see what the plan was, and that's called booked versus realized revenue matching, and identify underperforming deals proactively before you've run the full term and uh, have the salesperson follow up. And then 
some of the advanced automated leakage I was just mentioning about. So those are some of the things. Just quick anecdote. Um, you know, we had a client that uh, European uh, based. The banking business is multi-regional kind of business typically. They were trying to substantially grow their value creation and their, improve their risk-weighted assets, which is quite important with all the banking regulation that's going on around the world. In 12 months, a little bit more complex because it was an eight-country rollout. Um, uh, actually, the first 12 months only hit the first five. We're now, we were in eight by a few months after that, and we're now uh, going to 12. Um, but you know, very quickly had a value-based client assessment of every single client. And in some of those markets, it's not just the internal data. Remember the broad data point? You can actually, in some of them, get all the government data on what other, because there's all kinds of reporting in the banking industry. What is my same customer buying from my competition? How much loan volume do they have? What's their business? What else can I find out about them? How can I enrich my attribute database so that I can better predict, like we were just talking about? All that was up and running. And we had three core things that the tools were an enabler for. You heard my comments earlier on the panel. This is fundamentally a human challenge. Part of that is getting people to buy into the change. So we helped build confidence and demonstrate it for senior commitment. Um, we helped get the proof of concept uh, up and running, very similar to what I just showed you in the B2B case at first, but then ultimately full on enterprise class with all the security you need in the banking world uh, and a very agile development path to continually respond based on what we learned market by market. Just to give you an example of the economic value added tree, something that nearly every relationship manager would like. In this particular case, you go in and you say, wow, I've got an automotive customer. My current economic value added is, uh, gosh, one third of what it could and should be. And I actually understand, I decompose that into all of its elements. Well, what you'll see quickly when you do that, and it's highlighted on the right here, but my lending fees volume is low and my share of wallet is very low compared to what they're buying from other folks. Wow, I have an opportunity here. Why is that off? Well, probably because I'm charging them too much interest margin and I'm doing that primarily because I don't have enough collateral, not because I understand the share of wallet potential. Having made this available in a few seconds, you can quickly see what your strategy needs to be as a relationship manager with that customer. You've deployed these insights all the way to the front line. And how many relationship managers can do any of the calculations on this page? About half. How many of them can do all of the calculations on that page? About zero. But in seconds, they can have it in front of them and they can have it for every single customer, reweighted, rank ordered. They typically will have, you know, 30 to 80, maybe even 100 customers the relationship manager will have. They'll typically know 10 of them really well, and they'll be able to guess well on that front. But uh, to know all of them is quite low. I think you've probably already read the quotes up on the page. The point is, it impacted the way people worked. So when should I look for pricing and sales enablement opportunities? How does big data actually change my revenue growth? When you have any one of these following things, do you lack transparency on your product or customer level profitability? Even better if you have the cross hash of those two. Do you have a complex product portfolio? Is that hard for people to keep it all in their head and know who to offer it and when to offer it where? And do you have decentralized decision making? If so, these techniques that we were just talking through, they're not the only ones available, but these particular techniques would be probably applicable to you. So the question then becomes, it's available. The future started in 2012, but the leaders are the only ones that have made the leap. Are you in a position to lead? Thank you very much.